Hello, my name is Justin Stairs. Welcome back to the Brussels Signal Studio. We're doing a remote interview today, and the subject is Ireland. We have a Maliki Steenson, who is a an independent candidate in Ireland. He's running in the EU elections and also the local elections. He is a solicitor by trade, though he is very much a politician at the moment, both, both a would-be politician here in Brussels and a practicing politician in the Ireland immigration debate and other uh, debates. Good day, sir. Good morning. Uh, let's start, please, with a quick question on, on yourself. I know that you have a, a background in the Republican movement in Ireland and also the Workers' Party. Could you please explain where you come from politically? Well, I, I've been born and reared in the north inner city of Dublin, which would be described as a, uh, a socio-economically deprived area of, of, of the city. Um, I've been involved in, as have my parents and grandparents, been involved in the Republican movement since the beginning of the last century. Um, and I've been involved in various different groups. I did stand for election for the Workers' Party, who, who would be seen to be on the left side of republicanism. Um, and the, the, the issue for me and for Republicans has always been the issue of sovereignty. And that was initially sovereignty from Britain, and that's why we had a rising in 1916, why we had 800 years of struggle in this country to end British occupation and to end um, the influence of Britain on the affairs of our, our country. We succeeded in part in that we got them out of 26 counties, of the 26 counties, but they still remain in occupation of the six counties, which is on the northeastern part of the island. Um, in, after having 50 years of so-called independence in the 26 counties, we immediately joined what we believed that, that in 1972 was a European common market, which has now become effectively, effectively a federal union, where a little country like us, which now has five and a half million of a population, which had three and a half 15 years ago, has very little say. And the political class and NGO class in this country are wedded to the idea of further integration in Europe against the will of the people. I mean, the people in this country, because of our constitution, if there's a substantial change and sovereignty is ceded, then we must have a referendum. In Lisbon, the people rejected um the, the 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 new treaty, and we were made go back and vote again with very little change. I remember the same. I think, yeah. So we have a, a history in this country of you do as you're told, and you don't you to go back and do it again. Um, but for me, sovereignty is about the right of the Irish people to determine our own destiny without influence from whether it be London, Brussels, or indeed New York or Washington, uh, and and we must be free to do that and not have. Um, as it is now, over 90% of legislation that's brought in in this country comes from Brussels. And we have no say in that. We have a so-called government here who are just puppets of the EU, our okay. MEPs who currently sit in, in uh, Brussels are no better and are wedded to this woke liberalism and this destruction of our country. And, you know, I've got involved in, in politics here again. I had kind of stepped back from politics in 2014 concentrate on business and you know I'd stood for election a number of times and failed to get elected and when this issue emerged in in a serious way because we've had immigration for many years but in, in 2022 it just seemed to, to go from an acceptable level to something that is totally unacceptable and has overwhelmed the country partly because of the Ukrainian issue where people were just over 100,000 um, or almost 100,000 Ukrainians were brought in here and we don't have the infrastructure. There's something like um, 800,000 tax numbers given out in the last year, and only 80,000 of, 80, of those are to our indigenous people. So there's something fundamentally wrong with a country which doesn't have the housing stock, the hospital stock, the school stock, or any other main infrastructure to support an increase in the population, and the, the political class just continued to, to do that. Okay, okay. L lots of issues there. I, I want to focus to uh, uh, drill down on, on one of them in particular, and that's uh, immigration, migration. Now, uh, you are involved, were involved in the East Wall 
anti-migration protests of 2022, which is the date you mentioned. You're one of the leaders of this movement, as I understand it. Um, That's correct. Yeah. And the second uh, bit of background for our listeners and viewers that I wanted to mention is that uh, immigration is a huge issue now in Ireland and perhaps responsible for the surge in interest uh, for uh, independent candidates like yourself. So can we just quickly go back to 2022, uh, the East Wall protest? Um, yeah, well, what was East your East role there, please? East, East Wall protest started in November 2022 when the government here decided to take an old office building and populate it with um, nearly 400 single male migrants from we don't know where, but we pointed out at, at the time that many of them were in fact coming from the UK, having been there for many years, either having failed in their asylum applications over there or were, were um, coming via France and in, into the UK. Now, we were called fascists, we were called racists, we were called all kinds of things for raising those things. Now, as we sit now in, in uh, May 2024, 16, 17 months later, all of the points that we made at the time have been confirmed by the government. We were called, they said that we were um, giving out misinformation, that we were lying. We made, for instance, the question why somebody could get on a plane in London, get off the plane in, in Dublin and have no identifying documents. I have never uh, flown to London or anywhere else where I didn't have to produce a passport. So these people had passports getting onto the planes, but didn't have them getting off. And we raised the issue of, how do you know who these people are? And they said, oh, well, we run them through Eurodac, the, the, um, the, EU database. the database, and we take their fingerprints. Last week, we discovered that some guy who was um, appeared in court for some burglaries or, or something like that, had 20, when they put his fingerprints through Interpol, he had 25 different names in France and in Britain. So that's what we were faced with. They, they told us that these people were fleeing from war and persecution. The bulk of them were coming from Georgia. So there's no war in Georgia and there's no war in London. And it went on from there because the government's position was to, and their current position is to buy up every office block or rent it or lease it um, and house people in it. Without, I mean, that raises huge issues of fire safety, for instance, for those people. And the people, the immigrants who are coming in, it's not their problem. The Minister for Integration here, Roderick O'Gorman, sent around a tweet a number of years ago in, I think, eight to ten different languages saying, come to Ireland and we'll give you your own accommodation within six months. So naturally, somebody sitting somewhere with nothing to do and no money and no job said, oh, should we go over there? Now, aside from the immigration, I mean, there's different streams of this. We brought in a huge amount, hundreds of thousands of, of migrant workers. I mean, if you look at the health system in this country and the, the, the left and all those will say, oh, well, it wouldn't work if we didn't have migrants in it. And there's a difference, obviously, between migrants and asylum seekers. When they went to um, the, 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 if you look at the hospitals, for instance, we train nurses and doctors and we export them because they can't afford to live here. They can't afford to rent a, a property. So they go off to Australia, England, New Zealand, America to, to, to practice. And we import nurses and that from the Philippines and other low cost countries. And you know, there's something fundamentally wrong when you're exporting people and you're importing people at the same time. And the reasons for that is to drive down costs because most of the, uh, say, Filipino nurses are contract workers. They're, they're employed not by the health service, but they're employed by outside contractors who just funnel them in when they're needed. So they don't have the same rates of pay. They don't have the same um, entitlements to, to pension and that that employed workers would have and that's something that you know we have to stand up against but it, it seems incredible that the left who you know were established particularly the trade union movement in britain were established to stop cheap labor coming into the uk and driving down the wages of, of ordinary workers that they fully support an open borders policy um, and after east wall more and more communities around the country got up and said 
we're not allowing this to happen in our community. They were taking over hotels and putting in I-pass applicants, that's international protection applicants, um, who are mainly single men, yet you're told in a community, if you're told anything at all, that, oh, it'll be women and children, and that's used as an emotional thing in order to say to people, oh, well, sure you wouldn't stop women and children, whereas men, it's totally different. Allied to that, there's a huge increase in crime. Um, and even la last November, there was three young children stabbed. Yes, this was the, the, the riots in Dublin. Well, I mean, they called it a riot. What happened was there was some disorder and there was a couple of buses burned and, a, and a, a tram was burned. But if you look at any European city, and indeed if you look at Belfast or Derry any years during the conflict, this wouldn't even register as a riot. But it was used by the political class to push um, legislation, to, to stop us speaking out, basically. And it, it, it's been milked and used right around the world as to imply that that those who are opposed to the immigration policy followed by the state are somehow violent. And we have had hundreds of protests and there has been no violence at, at any of them. In fact, any violence that has occurred on one or two protests has been caused by the left. For instance, we had a protest in the inner city where a, a, an active member of Antifa drove a car into a protest, injuring a couple of people. Now, he's before the courts on charges relating to that, but that's the, the violence certainly has not come up from our side. I mean, we have the numbers of people who are ordinary, decent people, and you can see that from the footage of the um, protest last bank holiday Monday and any other time we've had a protest, that are ordinary, decent people who, um, you know, are more happy to go around their, their normal business, rear their kids, work in their jobs, you know, relax at the weekends, than have to get out and campaign to save... Uh, um, create a future for our children that the state is denying them. So, now, as I understand it, the surge in interest for independence such as yourself is connected to the refusal of all mainstream parties to even talk about migration and the issues you've just raised. Is that fair? Yes, I mean, and, and there's a lack of faith. I mean, we have three, a, a three-party government currently um, Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, and the Greens. And the Greens are the smaller party, and they seem to be the tail that's wagging the dog. Oh, the other two would have emerged from civil war politics, but really they're no different. It's the same side of, of the coin. We have the, the largest opposition party, which was Sinn Féin, who expected to be the lead in lead party in the next government, um, which the election for that happens has to happen before March of 2025. But they are on board totally with the immigration policy um, followed by the government. And in fact, they want more um, applications to come in and more people to come in. Um, we have, you know, a, a collapse in the political system in this country. And in Ireland, the political class and the political system can't be disconnected from the NGO culture that we have, which are supposed to be non-government organisations. And we have, believe it or not, 33,000 NGOs in this country who are funded to the tune mainly by the taxpayer of 6.5 billion per year. I mean, that led to, to somebody at a, a UN conference on the panel of the UN conference a number of years ago asking, does everybody in Ireland work for an NGO? And there's something like a quarter of a million people who form policy and the political class then reacts to that policy. And it, it, they're all woke liberals who are totally in support of open borders and believe that this nation should actually be deconstructed and that culture, that sovereignty, and that anything that we hold here in this country should be totally abandoned. And that's not what anything, the, the people were never asked to do on this. And there hasn't been one debate on mainstream media on immigration since November 2022. They will have three or four people on a debate who come from the same side of the coin. They'll, be, they'll appear to be different. They, they'll come from different political parties, but ultimately, they're all saying the same thing. They may argue about, well, you know, should people be put in tents or into to office blocks? But they, they, they won't debate whether they should be coming here at all. And there is no doubt that the welfare system in this country and the promise of accommodation is a draw and is attracting people. And that's simply um, a reality. And the government now recognises that because yesterday at the Cabinet meeting, they decided that they would cut um, the payments to... Ukrainian refugees to the same level as um, 
bypass applicants. And I mean, whether that's legally permissible, I, I would say not, because a refugee and the Ukrainians have been given refugee status under the temporary directive, which extends until March of next year. And the basis of, of refugee status is that it gives you the same rights as an indigenous citizen. So I can't see how legally they can reduce that money and, and payments to those. The only difference between payment to a Ukrainian refugee and a, an indigenous, a di indigenous citizen is that for the, the citizen, it's uh, means tested, whereas it's not means tested for Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. And that would appear to me to be the only difference. So I, I don't see how they can argue that they're, they're going to do this. And they've said they'll do it in 12 weeks, but in four weeks, the election is over and that will be dropped just as... So could you put this uh, Irish debate into a European context, perhaps? Because obviously there, in the UK, there has been this kerfuffle over the Rwanda deal and the impact it is having on Ireland. And then here in Brussels, where we're working, there is now new legislation called the Migration Pact. Um, will that have an impact on this de debate where you are? Well, well, firstly, the Rwanda policy is leading people to leave the UK and come into the North. Now, the High Court in Belfast has said because of the Good Friday Agreement, um, the Rwanda policy won't apply to people who enter the six counties. So now you're going to see a huge influx from mainland UK into the six counties, which will spill over into the south, no doubt. And the, I mean, the British government says they're going to deal that judgment. And it would seem to me that they will succeed under our appeal. But the, um, the Rwanda policy, I mean, there are many European countries now and people who are opposed to the current immigration policy and are standing right throughout Europe who are opposed to the migration pact. I mean, the Dublin government yesterday, when it was voted on or the day before, abstained. And they will come back now and say this, oh, well, we didn't vote for it. But they didn't vote against it. They abstained. And they're trying to sell the Migration Pact here as something positive. But there's nothing in the Migration Pact that they can't do already. We already have the Dublin Convention, for instance, which means we can send um, people back to the first uh, country they entered where they should uh, claim asylum. And we, we, we don't do that. We issued the deportation orders, and I think just off the top of my head, it, 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 there's thousands of deportation orders issued, and the numbers of, of them that are actually enforced are in the tens, you know, 10 or 20. And when we ask the government about this, they say, oh, well, they must be gone because they're not claiming welfare. Sure, they don't know where they are. And that's, you know, they, they refuse to accept that there's an underground um, market in work and there are people working without any kind of permits in, in all kinds of jobs. Um, and they assume that if they issue the deportation order, somebody just leaves. I mean, mm. how can you run a country and have an immigration policy where somebody applies for asylum and are refused. And over 90% of applications in this country for uh, asylum are refused at first instance. Then they go and appeal it and they're still refused. Then an NGO will fund them to go to the High Court. That will drag on for years. Many are given what's called humanitarian, humanitarian leave to remain because these cases take up to, up to 10 years to go through the system. So it will be unfair, the state says, to, to send those people out of the country when they, they now have roots here. And in, in the small number of cases where deportation orders are um, issued, you're told to just go and self-deport. You know, there's no yeah. border force yeah. to take you out of the country, for instance. So what do you think to the Rwanda deal? What I suggested was that when Richie Sunak, you know, was filling his planes up in uh, whatever British Army, uh, British Air Force base he does it in, that he should keep a few seats on it and pop into Dublin on the way and we'll fill the seats for him. Okay, okay. And, now, there's you know, one other subject and, I wanted to address, and that is free speech and the Irish hate speech bill, which is uh, one of the other, not a lot of Irish politics uh, makes its way here to Brussels, but we've been hearing about the Irish hate speech bill, particularly after Elon Musk got involved. Now, uh, as I understand it, efforts to implement the bill nearly succeeded last year uh, before Elon Musk's in intervention. And the legislation, as I understand it, is controversial in that hate speech is not defined. Is that the case? Yes. Well, well firstly, if you look, look at free speech, there's only free speech in this country if you agree with the state and the NGO sector. If you don't, then your opinion doesn't matter and you're not allowed to articulate it. 
Um, now, the, the hate speech bill was being brought in and all of the political parties in, in the parliament, including Sinn Féin, voted for it. And in fact, Sinn Féin, who are supposed to be the main opposition party, wanted to include other groupings like travellers and migrants into the hate speech legislation. And just to give you an example of, of what would be um, a crime under, under this legislation, if somebody sent you a picture, for instance, in a WhatsApp group, and if you never even opened it, of something that somebody considered to be um, hate speech. And there's no definition for what, what hate speech is. So it's totally subjective. So if I say something is hateful to me or offensive to me, then that's I can have you prosecute, I can report that to the guard, to the police service, and they will then have to prosecute you. Now, you could have that on your phone or on your device, any device. You may never have even looked at it. You mightn't have even shared it, but you would be guilty of an offence. It also gives the state the power to enter your home and seize all electronic devices in that premises. Not just your devices, but devices, say, of your wife and your children and anybody else who happens to be there or in the business place. And it's a draconian legislation, and it's brought about by fear by the state because they fear the rise of the people and they fear that people like us who are out there articulating what's really going on in this country and they want to shut it down. And uh, But I, I certainly they're not going to bring it in before the local and European elections. And I, I think that they may well just pass the book to the next government um, because it's not the hassle that they're now getting over it and the, the pressure that's coming on them, and particularly after somebody like Elon Musk. Um, and we have to thank people like him for highlighting this. And he has indicated that should anybody be charged and brought before the courts under this legislation, if it comes in, that um, he will fund their defence. And, and we welcome that. And hopefully he lives up to his word in that. Um, but the reality is they want to shut down debate. They don't want to have discussions. Um, for instance, and, and I'm seen as one of the key leaders of the, the movement that emerged from East Wall in November 2022, I have not been interviewed by any of the mainstream media. Now, just even in relation to these upcoming European elections, RTE, the major state, the main state broadcaster, who we spent a million quid and quired into what was going on there in the past couple of years, who got a £20 million government bailout just recently, have decided in line with um, the Electoral Commission, which is another state appointed quango, that the people that they will interview on debates are allowed to be on debates on mainstream media, on, on their programmes, will be people who are already elected to Europe or to the, to the Parliament and Leinster House, or members of parties who have achieved more than 5% in the last elections. So that excludes effectively every independent who is standing in this country from primetime debates. It excludes people who are in small parties who haven't achieved 5% in the last elections. And that is something that is anti-democratic. And that is something that the state now is, is um, pushing because they're afraid. They're afraid to allow me onto a debate because they know <coughs> that everything I say is common sense. And they know that everything that they have said has been a lie. And recently we had two referendums in this country um, in March, the 8th of March, <coughs> to take out women out of the Constitution and replace them with this non-specific specific kind of rubbish. <coughs> and we then, and we had a second referendum as well. <coughs> Both of those were not wanted by the people. Both of those were referendums that the government thought would sail through. <coughs> and in fact, they were roundly defeated on both. So what we have said is that the upcoming elections are in fact um, a referendum on immigration, just as we made <coughs> those referendums um, a referendum on immigration. <coughs> and I pointed out in November 2022, I said quite clearly that we would make immigration the only issue in the next elections. And it is the only issue. All of our other problems in this country, whether it's housing or health, schools, water infrastructure. Imagine in this country, we've increased the population by one and a half million in 15 years. We haven't built one more water reservoir or one more uh, electrical um, generating uh, power station. place. We have, we have brought in wind farms, but we simply replaced 
peak born in stations, but wind farms. So we haven't actually increased the supply of electricity, yet we've increased the population by one and a half million. We haven't increased, as I say, the water supply. We haven't built one more hospital. You know, it beggars belief that a political class can think, get away with that kind of activity forever. So on June the 7th, we will be having a referendum on immigration and the people in Ireland have an opportunity to reject what has gone on for the past number of years and vote for sanity, vote for same politics and vote to put people like me in who will try with other people in Europe of like mind to change the direction of Europe and make it a Europe of its people, for its people, not a Europe that's run by the political elites and controlled and run for their benefit for, of, of the political class and, and an NGO class and a, an elite class who believe that they're above the ordinary people. Now that, that okay, that... and what our intention is to take back our nation from these people, and the time is now to do it because if we don't do it now, it's over. Now and we will have lost you mentioned lives. taking back your nation from Europe, but I can can I assume that what you mean is you want to change the European Union as um, many other parties do and not leave it. Well, well, firstly, uh, we want to take back our country and our nation from the political class and NGO class that currently run it in our island. <clears throat> and then we certainly want to begin to talk about reforming the European Union and bringing it back to just a trading entity, not something that controls our lives at every, every, every juncture. Now, and if we don't succeed in that, then we have to begin debate, the debate about leaving the European Union. OK, OK, so you're going to give it a try first. Try reform, and if that doesn't well, work, if it doesn't reform, it. then we reform. If it can't, then there's nothing in it for us. You know, we're, net, we're, we're, we're not beneficiaries from Europe. We're actually net contributors, and we have lost, for instance, billions in our fishing industry. Where Irish fishermen are not allowed to fish um, air waters, but but French and Spanish ships can come in and just drain the seas. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, now uh, we've been running here at the Brussels Signal, we've been running statistics suggesting that independents like you are actually doing very well in the polls. Is that this your personal situation in public? Well, certainly the reaction we're getting on the doors is hugely supportive. Now, how that translates, nobody will know until we count the votes on June the 8th, but there will be a huge push. And, and I mean, there are some independents who are not as independent as they would like to make out. There are a lot of bandwagon jumpers out there who are jumping on this issue and have, you know, no involvement and trying to take advantage of the fact that people are moving from political parties to independence. Um, I believe that, that we will be successful and that we will achieve a breakthrough. Um, the level of that breakthrough, you know, remains to be seen. But, you know, I'm optimistic, uh, as are many other people, and we need to take back our nation, as I say, and let it be run for the benefit of its people. That's great, uh, my we appreciate your time and please promise to come and visit us here in the Brussels Signal Studio if and when you're elected. We're just around the corner from the European Parliament now. Huh? I look forward to that and I've no doubt I will be there sometime in June. That's great. Many thanks. Many thanks. And thank you once again thank for watching.